What a thrill it is to be here on this grand occasion, the opening of Edward Evans Hall, the new home of the School of Management. This session we're going to devote not to business and, and leadership in a complex world, but rather to the building itself, and I think it'll be a fascinating session. I think Ted Snyder did a lovely job of indicating in the last panel the ways in which the school's programmatic objectives and its new architectural reality dovetail and interact, and I hope we can build upon that in this session. We're going to hear from Lord Foster, uh, who probably needs no introduction, but he is a 1962 graduate of the Yale School, then of Art and Architecture, now the Yale School of Architecture. Um, uh, and he, um, he has done magnificent work around the world, as I'm sure many of you know. The, the Beijing Airport, wonderful, both commercial and public buildings in London. Uh, world, won the Pritzker Prize in Architecture, one of the, one of the world's leading architects uh, and one of the most distinguished graduates in history of the Yale School of Architecture. It's been an immense pleasure working with Norman through the course of this project. And uh, we, we um, the choice of Norman is an interesting one. It's worth relating. It relates to what Sharon Oster said earlier about the conservatism of the faculty. Before we started the project, we polled the students at the School of Management. What type of building would you like? Would you like a building that's uh, colonial, like Pearson or Davenport College? Or would you like a neo-Gothic building, like Sterling Library and most of the colleges? Or how about a contemporary building for a 21st century business school? <laughs> Can you guess which finished last? <laughs> and of course, what did the students want? They wanted James Gamble Rogers. They wanted, they wanted collegiate Gothic. The faculty, of course, Sharon had that one right, they didn't want any of the above. They wanted their offices in the mansions on Hill House Avenue. <laughs> As a president, I was feeling rather lonely. However, I had the benefit of 16 fellows of the Yale Corporation, and we in our, I think we will all conclude great wisdom, decided that the right answer for a new residential, new pair of residential colleges was neo-Gothic, but the right answer for a 21st century school of management was contemporary. And with that, we uh, had a, a submissions from a number of truly great architects. And Lord Foster's drawings, which were kind of ethereal and very sketchy, gave the, gave, for, for that competition, gave, gave exactly, I would say, the feel that this ended up giving uh, giving to us uh, today as we walk through those doors of a light, open, airy, um, trans, uh, transparent space where, where one can see the activities of the school uh, throughout, where light is uh, abundant. It's a wonderful, just a truly wonderful building. And I am so grateful uh, to Lord Foster and his team for delivering this to us. So I think it might be a good moment to thank Lord Foster and his group. <laughs> I want to also take just one minute to, uh, to recognize, as, as, as many said, that it takes a village to uh, build a new village. And, and uh, we, we've acknowledged the wonderful support we've had from donors and alumni, uh, the input and planning efforts, the, the input of faculty and students, which once they got on board was very valuable uh, as the project went on. But I want to also mention the internal Yale team that worked on this project, the, the people from Yale facilities, and the people from the School of Management in particular, Bruce Alexander, John Bollier, uh, Laura Cruikshank, Dave Parnagoni, John Olson, Mark Francis, Alice Roucher, all from Yale facilities, and of course, Stan Gartska and Diane Palmieri from the School of Management. Their help and their work uh, and their insights about this project as it went along were absolutely indispensable. So thanks to all of the team. <laughs> We're going to have Lord Foster lead off, and then we have two uh, other distinguished 
deans of architecture to comment on uh, the building and share their reflections on how it works uh, to create uh, a, a, great, a great school of management. Uh, Karen Van Langen is, has, was until recently the dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. Virginia, arguably the only other American campus that reaches the same level of architectural distinction as <laughs> Yale <laughs> University. Maybe even Jefferson gets a little edge, who knows, but it's a <laughs> wonderful place. And Karen's leadership of that school very much focused on the, educating students through the architecture of the campus. They, they, they had a major project during her tenure to rebuild their own facilities, as redesign their own facilities at, at the Virginia School of Architecture. And also, there's a lot of Jefferson in the curriculum, because uh, there's a lot of interesting things to see right there at home. Um, our final speaker will be Dean Robert A.M. Stern, uh, who has been the Dean of the Yale School of Architecture since 1998, renowned throughout the world for his wonderful work, most especially wonderful uh, residential buildings, but also a wonderful stable of academic buildings uh, uh, around and campuses throughout the country and, and now even in China, uh, where he's building two new residential, uh, a new residential college uh, at Tsinghua University. Um, dean Stern has been a transformational dean of the Yale School of Architecture uh, and understands, I think, very much what makes a, a great school work. He himself presided over the renovation of Paul Rudolph's uh, a remarkable home for the School of Architecture. And so he has a lot of experience in trying to understand how spaces interact with program and make for a very successful school. So we look forward to his comments in this panel. So we'll each of the three will make opening remarks, I think from the podium, uh, since uh, I think they, have, they may have some pictures to present, at least Lord, Lord Foster does. And, um, and then we'll follow perhaps with a little interaction on the panel, and then we'll open up to questions from the floor. And also, if you're sitting in one of the overflow spaces here, um, here at the School of Management, you'll, be, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions as well. With no further ado, Lord Norman Foster. Thank you. <clears throat> President uh, Salovey. President Emeritus Levin, Dean Snyder, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's more than 50 years since I was a student here at Yale. And um, that was in an age before the digital revolution that in turn has revolutionized the, all the issues of teaching and learning but some things are a constant, whether one looks 50 years back, whether one is in the present, or whether one's looking 50 years into the future. And perhaps I often say to myself and others that it's important to state the obvious. Why was I attracted to Yale? It was the great tradition of teachers. And whether we're in snooks, mooks, or whatever, <laughs> we come back to the core values and importance of teachers. I was privileged to have Paul Rudolph, Sir Chemaya, Finn Scully. And since then, I've realized that there are great Yale traditions. Because if you have great teachers, you need great buildings. And there is this extraordinary tradition of generous, enlightened donors, I think very, very special to this place, who in turn have created an extraordinary range of modern buildings. And I was enormously tempted, and I didn't realize until today, the, the Beinecke family and its tradition, because I was going to show the Beinecke Library, which for me is one of the most moving monuments of modern architecture. Instead, I chose this building, which is the Kahn Building of 1953, the Yale Art Gallery, for the simple reason that that is where, before it moved into Paul Rudolph's building, the architecture studio was. And here, I took this photo in 1962. 
It's looking into perhaps the essence of a space which typifies Yale, which is the quadrangle. And that's Jonathan Edwards. I was guest fellow at Jonathan Edwards. And that whole tradition of American Gothic collegiate, it's interesting that the Henry Fellowship would send students from here to Oxford and Cambridge and from Europe uh, to Yale and Harvard. And, um, and there are very strong architectural connections. Uh, we know about James Gamble Rogers, and it wasn't the first building in Yale, but it set that American collegiate Gothic uh, style with the hierarchy of courtyards and enclosures, which are extraordinary in terms of their range of scale and communality, whether it's the larger gathering spaces or whether it's the more intimate courtyards, which become, in a way, extensions of the, uh, of, of, of the community in terms of teaching. They're not just places to stroll, but they are interactive spaces. So that very, very strong tradition is one of the inspirations for the present building. If one uh, traced the, uh, the roots of this site and the way that the campus evolved, it was in 1919 the group of trustees uh, commissioned a vision of Yale that would in a way unify and bring together the north -south, uh, a north-south axis and the two east-west axes. And that, um, although it was transformed later by Rogers, um, is the very essence and explains the campus as it is at the moment. And if we include in this the later development, the Olin Science Master Plan, you can see the site right at the bottom, ringed in red, which is the library site. And if we put that into the historic context of the School of Management before it finally moves here, and that's the Ed Larrabee Barnes, one of six buildings. So the School of Management really dispersed around these six buildings, 110,000 square feet, originally designed for 200 students, squeezing 400 students in. So very, very interesting transformation to dissolve all those sites into one site. Um, here you can see the individual buildings scattered around and the way that they finally come together uh, on this site in a building which is more than twice the size. And a very interesting change of scale. Uh, not surprising that many universities have they evolved from quite small scale um, core buildings have, have changed over, over time as the needs for more space, greater density, more compact. So here I think we're seeing the transformation from the, the core um, around two or three stories to a new scale, uh, in this case uh, around the uh, traditional concept of the heart of a community, the internal quadrangle, the symbolic significant space, and using uh, transparency and lightness to, in a way, dissolve the larger mass of those buildings ca catering to a larger quantum uh, of students. And I think that we've heard earlier the very strong, very radical, very interesting uh, philosophy behind uh, the School of Management. And, uh, and that is, uh, in a way, here we've tried to compress that into one diagram which sums up the headlines of the original competition brief in 2007. And it was very much, um, back then, anticipating perhaps some of the events which have followed. It was, in a way, quite prophetic. Um, it has a very strong moral, philosophical, relevant um, uh, uh, series of headings today. But for me, as an architect, and not in this world of, of, of business, it seems to me it was 
really very visionary for its time. And so an architecture which is about light and lightness, about accountability, about community, about cross-fertilization, about creating the opportunities for different disciplines to engage, that in a way is the very essence of buildings which over the last few decades, whether it's in Silicon Valley, whether it's research buildings for medical, it's all about the interaction, the social spaces. And, um, and for us, very exciting the way in which that has evolved out of one team, a team which has uh, embraced uh, the, the students, the faculty, uh, ourselves, um, past, uh, past deans, and Stan's extraordinary contribution to that process and a very engaging conversation discussing that uh, earlier today in one of the, the classrooms. Because the classrooms range in their concepts from quite radical, in-the-round, team-based spaces, as well as the more traditional uh, lecture-style hall. And I've chosen one called the interactive, which is very much about how a, a group can have proximity with a teacher, break down the barriers, and use the technology to link globally so that you can have professors from other schools, you can have heads of industry, all engaging. And difficult to communicate in a few, few minutes the extraordinary amount of investigation, research, working from small models, making larger models, and then making full-size mock-ups, tuning, adjusting those, um, being very, very sensitive to the dimensions, to the acoustics, and one modeling device, literally the full-size uh, mock-up, the other, uh, a visualization, and finally, of course, here mocked up with some of our team from the New York office to try to give some simulation of how it would, would, would start to come together with a, a real life audience. So it's very exciting being on the cusp of this, uh, of this experience. Of course, do you design a building from the inside out or do you design a building from the outside in? The reality, of course, is that you have to be sensitive to both aspects because it's the private world within, it's the public world uh, outside. So do you start with the classroom and work out, or do you start outside and work in? Of course, it's totally interactive because it's about all of these different spaces, which are all part of the learning, educational, cross-fertilization. So in a way, the building grows out of this philosophical debate and this exploration in terms of what is an appropriate environment going into the future. For, uh, for civic leaders, uh, for managers, but in, in, in a far wider context. So in that sense, the building about its transparency, about, its, uh, 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 about the way it expresses the circulation, it uses the traditional Yale color of blue for those enclosed areas which, uh, which need to be protected and cocooned from the outside world. So it's the range of the enclosed, the solid, and the transparent, the glass, and the lightness. If I tried to interpret that, to try to give you an idea of how these activities come together, then obviously the first floor, the entrance level, is very much about the commonality, the social aspects, it's about the coffee bar, it's about the lounges. And then as you move up to the level above, um, then that is access to the 16 classrooms, uh, the mixture of the five different types that I mentioned, the library, a pivotal position right over the main avenue, Whitney, and then the breakout spaces, which are seen not just as circulation, but very uh, sim symbolically important and also educationally important. And then the um, the offices, the administration, which serves and drives and has different needs, greater privacy in some respects. Um, if we look at the grouping of those classrooms, there is an, an echo back to the original School of Management in the reference to the uh, so-called Hall of Mirrors. 
And again, that is very much about the social interaction, and that's translated in this new building into the cloisters. And here you can see our visualization. This was created during the design process to try and communicate and explore and examine the kind of atmosphere, the quality, uh, the, 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 the welcoming aspect of the building. And, um, and of course, that visualization now translates into the building uh, as it has uh, currently e evolved. If, um, if I went back to that last image, and we can see that the courtyard is at the heart of the building, Imagine if I took a slice through the whole building. What it would reveal are those parts which you cannot see. In other words, you would not see that below this building was really quite a large car park. So the site was about the important things of sociability, of, of, of learning, of, of teaching. But it also has a very strong ecological agenda, and it is targeted for, uh, for lead gold. And, um, and the cross section that I referred to, which is coming up now, shows that you can see the parking below the green. In the administration, you have chilled beams. You're not having large ducts, which are moving vast quantities of air. So it's very low energy in its concept. It has a high performance envelope. It has solar shading. It has displacement uh, ventilation. Uh, so the floor surfaces, for example, have small bore tubes embedded in them, uh, which makes them cold surfaces uh, during the heat of summer, warm surfaces uh, in, in the winter. So, uh, as it were, behind the scenes, there is a, another agenda. Also, the decision, uh, which I think was extraordinary enlightened and one that we uh, sought to encourage, was the integration of visual arts into the very fabric of the building. And here you can see Adrian Schiest in his studio uh, in Switzerland, uh, an artist that we had worked with before, and models here exploring how this atrium, which is working ecologically in terms of the movement of air through the building, but is also the social heart of the administration, and how bringing another culture into that. And that reminds me that one of the, I, I, th I think, the most powerful, enlightening aspects of my time at Yale was the way in which every, all the students uh, would gather, for example, for Vince Scully's uh, lectures. And he would talk about the roots of modern architecture. But in the, in the course of that, he would be talking about cinema, literature, music, the visual arts, sculpture. And, um, and the effect on that of generations of civic leaders uh, moving into society. I think the, 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 nobody has really tracked that influence through, but I believe very powerful. So Yale, for me, is unique in, its, in, in, in the way in which you get the cross-fertilization between the different disciplines. So I think a very enlightened move to incorporate uh, works of art. And here you can see uh, uh, when the sunlight penetrates to the base of this atrium, these colors become alive and they change as you move uh, around them, kind of crystalline paints. And then the extraordinary heritage, Yale is the, uh, is the home of the Sol LeWitt uh, archive. Again, um, an artist that uh, as a family we have very close connections with, so that was an extraordinary uh, coincidence. Um, and here you can see this very, very powerful uh, work at the base of the building and the way that it informs and kind of radiates out. So again, in a way, recapping, the building is the essence of its philosophy, of its brief, um, and is creating, seeking to create uh, this vibrant uh, community within the larger community. And that larger community is truly global. And I'm fascinated as I worked through earlier these locations, I realized that in the time since I left this university, which was a life-changing experience and for which I have immense gratitude, I've been able to um, engage as an architect 
in all of these places on this map, showing the collaborations that exist between this institution and the other institutions. And more than anything, any work of architecture infrastructure is a story of collaboration. And I'd just like to pay tribute to those that we work with here in the university. Our collaborating architects, Gruss and Santon, uh, extraordinary architects and a great joy uh, to work with. And the construction manager, uh, Dimeo, um, uh, for whom we're also grateful because our society really is about the making of things. I'd like to go on, I'd like to talk about my own team, but that would be indulgent. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. It's a bit daunting to follow Sir Norman Foster, but I will do my best. To the distinguished members and guests of the Yale University community, it gives me great pleasure to join you today in the opening of the celebration of Evans Hall. I stand before you today as an architect, as an educator, and as the former dean at the University of Virginia, where I championed the role of architecture as a communicative enterprise a principle that came alive for me as a longtime resident of Pavilion 9 in Thomas Jefferson's legendary academical village. And this is where I met and worked with Dean Snyder and where I came to appreciate the most important elements of what may, many consider to be an exemplary model of a democratic architecture for America. After almost 200 years, this institutional village still performs as an orchestrated space of relationships between nature and culture, between the public and the private realms, and by way of its brilliant planning strategies between predictable and unpredictable juxtapositions. This is an architecture of possibilities, of diversity, of openness, and also of transparency even in its brickness. Yet in today's technology-driven world, we might ask the question, does the physicality of architecture even matter anymore when most of us are isolated by earphones or visually distracted by our mobile devices in both the public and private realm? This indeed is one of architecture's most haunting challenges, to create environments that seamlessly accommodate current communication networks but that also have the presence to captivate us in real time and space, a performative architecture that can truly become an institutional home. So I see in Evans Hall this ambitious possibility. Of course, we're not surrounded by brick colonnades and pavilions, but we are in a type of village here, a global academical village. Emeritus, President Levin has referred to this building as a campus, and it is in this reference that we may discover its many attributes, the ways in which Evans Hall will frame the ambitious mission of this school. Winston Churchill once said, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So I would like to briefly highlight three themes to consider as we use the metaphor of the global village the planning strategy here, its materiality, and its overall aesthetic qualities. The planning strategy, as we have already heard, is very clear. It's functional and it is open. Its heart, as has eloquently been explained, is the courtyard, referential to Yale's precedence and so important to the coming together of a community. Its core of glass walls collapse the inner and outer worlds in a novel type of transparent public space. Its circular classrooms and oval classrooms arranged around this open space have both individual and collective personalities, a, a kind of new version of the academical village, and I would say that Thomas Jefferson would be so pleased. <laughs> The faculty and administrative courtyard adjacent to the central space gives recognition and communicative access to this important group. The plan is clear and it provides plenty of opportunistic experiences that will support the school's agenda. 
The materiality of the building is also a significant feature, as you have all noted. The use of glass, and lots of it here, dates back to the Stone Age. Glass is not a new material. However, its delineation as a glass campus is a contemporary one that eloquently acknowledges our world of flow and borderless space. Not only do these walls suggest transparency of vision and programmatic intention, they promote a reference to the world beyond, the open stairways, the library, the upper level terraces, visually connect us to its home at Yale where innovative new partnerships are being generated. Even the Yale art students have painted the Saul LeWitt artist um, panel at the cafe. And from almost any public space in the campus, the trajectories of the sun and the moon shall move across the spaces here day and night, activating the stunning Adrian Sheese wall and connecting the building to a much larger world, a world that shares this same light. In fact, today I wondered who among the many luminaries at this conference arranged for the Aurora Borealis to appear in the last two days. <laughs> That's a very good sign. <laughs> On a more personal note, were I a member of the community, I might carefully consider what I would wear to school. Not that I don't now, <laughs> but here the seductive transparency encourages a performative aspect to life on this campus, one which I, no doubt will serve to promote its professionalism at all levels. There is much to say about the materiality, but in, in the interest of time, I will only mention the well-articulated teaching halls. Comfortable and versatile, they are described by carefully detailed sensuous wood and fabric interiors. And these theaters are the setting for the actors and their audiences who will participate in these globally networked learning environments. And lastly, a comment on aesthetics. And it is from the three-dimensional aesthetic quality of this building that we can understand the whole of the project and the whole of the school. And here I divert for a moment to briefly speak about Sir Norman Foster and his significant contributions to the history of architecture. Foster is one of my generation's greatest heroes. I will also say that Dean Stern is another. Um, <laughs> he was also my teacher at Columbia. <laughs> um, and Foster was a leader in the post-World War era that sought to reinvigorate and redefine the dream of the modern movement that by the late 1950s had lost its way. During this period, several alternative and diverse design paths emerged. Foster's vision, based on his developed theory of systems thinking, along with his comprehensive and collaborative approach to design, has developed into a highly successful sophisticated and successful three-dimensional aesthetic. This aesthetic reflects the weaving together, the integration of innovative space planning and structure, of sophisticated lighting and building systems, and of the burgeoning digital and media technologies into a unified whole. In any part of this building, we can understand its logical integration of the systems and their parts. Its aesthetic beauty comes from this taught discipline synthesis that frames a thoughtful series of overlapping spatial volumes to create the essence of its cultural experience. Foster's early mentor, Buckminster Fuller, would be proud to witness the successful accomplishments of this visionary thinker and craftsman and craftsmen in the Richard Sennett definition, that the craft of making physical things provides insight into the techniques of experience that can shape our dealings with others. Both the difficulties and possibilities of making things well apply to making human relationships. Here at Evans Hall, the craftsmen, Foster and Partners, have provided and delivered a social and educational campus that appropriately complements 
Dean Snyder's vision and highly distinctive mission of creating the first comprehensive global network of schools of management and their communities. This is an ambitious and prescient undertaking. With its already 24 international partners, this building will become the generating hub, the home of this global community, including a newly integrated curriculum and one that will encourage leadership here at Yale as well as with its partners. So here we have come full circle, back to the Academical Village, or in this case, the Global Academical Village. Architects live for the moment when they can deliver not just a space or a facade, but a real place where direct communicative activities still form the basis of culture and where specificity and rigor can afford opportunistic reflections. Dean Snyder has earlier asked the question, could the Yale School of Management become the first global school, a business school in the United States without Evans Hall? And I believe that Evans Hall does matter in, in your mission, Dean Snyder, and that it will successfully provide the setting for your new programs and the growing international community that you serve. And it will do this in real time and space and across the mediated networks that you have made. So for this architectural team, it is that moment of achievement, an achievement to be shared by all of the collaborating partners. So to the Yale clients and their many generous donors, without whom a project of this magnitude and quality would not have been possible. There are no great buildings without creative and rigorous architects and without equally ambitious and supportive clients. And I certainly know that from my role as dean. So my congratulations to all of you. It feels like home to me. I can say that I've been given the easy part of just following two incredible people, incredible speakers. My classmate, uh, we were here at the same time, Norman Foster, and my uh, gr great student, Karen Van Lang. And I'm absolutely, I want to take this and just throw it all away, say they've said it all. But in any case, I do want to thank President Levin and President Emeritus Levin and Dean Snyder for <coughs> creating this event and allowing uh, me to add a few words to what you've already heard, which was so uh, eloquent. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in part on behalf of the School of Architecture because it's our pleasure to welcome Norman Foster back to Yale. He is one of our great and, and most loyal graduates, and he never ceases to speak with the greatest kindness of his time at Yale as he did to this evening with you. <coughs> and I think we all join, all our students and faculty join in the celebration of this exceptional building, Evans Hall, which they are all dying to be touring through. And Dean Snyder, don't worry, we'll, you'll be badgered by requests. Um, uh, and Norman has uh, so often taken, stated how much he took from Yale, and he did it tonight as a student. But those of us who were lucky enough to be a student when he was there, um, or to teach him, as Vincent Scully, Sterling Professor Emeritus, did, have always felt that he gave Yale as much, if not more, than Yale gave him. Norman brought something very special to Yale, elevating the discourse, and remind me, you remember he was a student, elevating the discourse to a higher plane than it then enjoyed, and we have been working very hard to keep that up ever since. Professor Scully, who was one of Norman's teachers and a powerful influence on his work, as he has said, regrets that he is unable to attend this ceremony and deliver his compliments in person. But he has asked that I write, I read a brief statement which he prepared to mark the occasion. Professor Scully writes, as a student at the Yale School of Architecture in 1961 and two, Norman Foster spent a good deal of his time studying American architecture, especially its pioneering steel frame and glass buildings, whose techniques he made his own. And now, 
Like his fellow student Richard Rogers, Norman is a life peer of the realm, and he endows Yale here with a lordly building, heroic in scale. The frame is still there, but stretched to tether a whole world of expanding spaces, enormous but light as air, challenging our whole middle-class urban structure, but sustaining that conversation between America and Great Britain, Yale and New Haven, in which he has continued to play a part. Joining Professor Scully, I can attest to the fact that Norman's student work at Yale was extraordinary. And I say this not just in hindsight. From the first project he undertook, and I vividly remember its presentation, to the ambitious project for the design of an entire city under Serge Tremayev, his teacher, which he developed with a few other students at the end of his time at Yale, it was clear that Norman Foster's was a remarkable talent. Along the way, collaborating with his fellow British student, and the year Norman was at Yale, it was con come to be known because there were other Brits in the class as the British invasion, anticipating the Beatles. <laughs> they copied. Um, Norman dazzled students and faculty alike with a master plan for what we now call Science Hill. Norman showed you Science Hill. You all who are Yaleys know what it is. It's right outside this building across the street. Norman's plan, um, and, and Richard Rogers, they did it together, was a um, restated the idea of the old campus of this university, but in a bold 20th century way. The design was the brave gesture of young Turks. Many were dazzled, including Philip Johnson, who actually had the commission. Well, he was dazzled and a little embarrassed, I think. Um, Norman's scheme <laughs> kind of put the shade a bit on Philip. Um, as I recall, Philip yanked a model, a tower off one of the projects and said, I don't like that one, put it in his pocket and took it home. Uh, <laughs> Evans Hall is magnificently well designed to meet the demands of teaching as it is conducted today, to support new techniques of teaching that are emerging and to satisfy the demands of faculty whom, as you've heard and as many of you know, had previously been isolated from each other but enjoying it in the Baroque <laughs> splendor of former mansions on Hill House Avenue, where they lorded it, as they thought all Yale professors did, where did they know how poor and squammy our rest of our faculty are housed. <laughs> Foster was the perfect architect to persuade SOM faculty to come out of their grand parlors and dark sitting rooms <laughs> where no one could find them and to move into light-filled offices proportioned to the needs of mere mortals, and in so doing to bring business education at Yale into the bright light of day. <laughs> at first glance, Evans Hall may seem uncharacteristic of Yale. As it was being constructed, I was frequently asked about its design. Badgered, I would say, would be the word. Many people wondered if it was, quote, a Yale building, end quote. Many SOM students, as you have heard, were hoping for something gothic and draped in ivy. By now, um, um, uh, that now that it's open to ex inspection, I hope those students and the ones who've come after will agree that Evans Hall is very much a Yale building. For one thing, and Norman has made this point so clearly that I'm only echoing uh, in an inept way what he so passionately pointed out in his talk. For one thing, Evans Hall is in Yale's tradition of courtyard buildings, a tradition that began in the early 19th century with the old campus, where a large open space is bounded by continuous walls of buildings. Not like the Harvard Yard, which is a mess in which Philip Johnson called plop architecture. <laughs> and he went to Harvard. <laughs> <coughs> That pattern was definitely confirmed by James Gamble Rogers, who's one of the great architects of the 20th century and a graduate of Yale. He shaped Yale uh, for 100 years uh, and more, not only in the residential colleges he designed, but also with his Sterling Memorial Library, with its wonderful courtyards, uh, and even more so in his building for the law school. And you have to remember that at Yale, very few schools, we have very few professional schools, and only a few have really defined buildings the law school, the architecture school, and now the school of management. Um, like these buildings, Evans Hall wraps around a courtyard, 
but replaces open air arcades with generous, gloriously glassed in corridors and lounges. Another way that Evans Hall takes a proper place in the typology of Yale's architecture is in its bold scale and self-assurance that has its precedent in the so-called bicentennial buildings designed by Carrere and Hastings, now Woolsey Hall and University Commons. Carrere and Hastings had just finished the design of the New York Public Library when they were asked to build here at Yale. Um, and, um, perhaps, but perhaps most significantly, Evans Hall fits into a tradition begun in the 1950s when new buildings of great distinction were commissioned for both practical and symbolic reasons. I refer to the years when Whitney Griswold, as president of the university, undertook a building campaign um, master plan behind the scenes by uh, Aero Saren, the great graduate of our school, the purpose of which was to reflect with striking new architecture that the university was embarked on a new era. Under Griswold, Beinecke Library, the Stiles and Morse Residential Colleges, and the Ingalls Rink led, to many, led many to question what a Yale building was. Given that the designs for the residential colleges and the Ingalls Rink were radically different from each other, although they were designed by the same architect, Aero Saarinen, many observers were confused and even disturbed. They probably had Harvard educations. Um, <laughs> more shocking to them was the fact that the rink was conceptually innovative while the residential colleges were conceptually traditional. But Griswold Hurl felt firm and established a policy that is honored to this day, certainly so by uh, President Emeritus Levin, and I'm hoping and I'm confident by President Holloway as well. Buildings must satisfy a function, but that's not enough. They must also boldly express their different purposes and their different positions in the campus context. Another Yale building conceived in the Griswold years, one that Norman Foster knows very well because as a student he helped with its drawings, is the Art and Archi Architecture Building designed by Foster's teacher and mine, Paul Rudolph, who was in charge of the architecture program as well as being an, a notable uh, pra in, uh, independent practitioner. While most Yale academic buildings are rather loose assemblages of classrooms serving various departments, the law school and even more so the Art and Architecture Building are visible expressions of distinct and specific graduate professional programs. As a consequence, each was specifically designed to fit a pedagogy. The Art and Architecture Building, now named Rudolph Hall at the request of Sid Bass, the donor of its renovation, in honor of its architect, like the law school, and now Evans Hall, is a building around a courtyard. Um, so it is a very Yale building through and through, but its courtyard is interior uh, and is the heart of the building pro uh, uh, to this day. When it opened in 1963, Capping Griswold, had just, Griswold had just died, Capping Griswold's business, building campaign, Rudolph Hall proved perhaps too closely fitted to a pedagogy based on a wonderful idea, the unity of the arts, that the art library, the art school, the school of architecture, all squeezed under one roof with an exhibition hall containing a lounge intended to bring together happy students and contented faculty from each discipline as if in one big happy family would work. It was a failure. The utopistic dream proved a nightmare and, so, and sadly R R Paul Rudolph Hall, then the Art and Architecture Building proved an artistic success, but a, f but a functional failure. And, its recent, and until its recent restoration, it was a whipping boy for the presumed failures of modern architecture as a whole. If you take risks, you're bound to get in a little trouble. I bring this up because the success of the renewed Rudolph Hall was crucial to giving the university the requisite courage to go forward with Evans Hall and its boldness. I have to point out the art school got its own new building uh, here. And by the way, Envy was brought up by Peter Salovey early. There's at least one dean here who's Envy and desperate for a new theater. So now that you've paid for this building, could you give him the theater? The <laughs> <laughs> we desperately need a new theater. And he's definitely envious and deservedly so. Uh, 
Um, I think when we renovated Rudolph Hall, um, when, and everybody saw that this was a great building and it could work properly uh, when, when programmed properly, uh, that everybody was so much more confident about going forward with Evans Hall in all its boldness. Um, Rudolph Hall made it clear that a building could be bold in its modernity, yet locked into Yale's traditional urbanistic and organizational typologies. This is the case as well with Evans Hall, a building that learns from the best of the past, but is designed in such a way as to avoid the pitfalls of a too specific accommodation to immediate patterns of teaching. I believe time will prove me right, and I'm coming to the end, uh, in saying that Evans Hall is not designed as a glove, um, tightly fitting a current pedagogy, but as a loose mitten that will allow it to accommodate changes in teaching techniques and technology over time, inevitable changes, I might add. And for me, this is the great strength that undergirds the crystalline beauty of the building we celebrate today and ensures its lasting value to the School of Management and to Yale. Thank you. I've never seen you miss a fundraising cue. And instead of asking the president for a drama school, here are the donors right here. <laughs> I've learned. Surely, I've learned. surely there is someone who loves theater. I would have asked you, but you're the former crowd. president. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have. I have one question for Norman. Did, did you actually think the, uh, of the analogy of your pods, the classroom pods, and the Jeffersonian pavilions? Because I think it was a. It's a nice analogy. No, I didn't. Yeah. No. Uh. But I think it is yeah. a very nice analogy um, because it is like a village. Uh, clusters of um, like buildings within a building. Um, pavilions, yes. It's a very nice uh, parallel. Oh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to have seen that when I came to visit it. I saw it has so much about how right. the uh, opportunities, and that's to me the most poignant part of the Academical Village are those enormous opportunities that come not only in the, in the classrooms, but in the interstitial spaces in between. And that's what you have in this building. It's huge. You remind me of something that um, was very high on our priorities in the early days of the design, and that was the, uh, the idea of change over time. So those pavilions as buildings within a building, you can take them down, you can reassemble them. Who knows in 50, 60 years, maybe the needs have changed. And um, so in that sense, you can take them away. The building doesn't fall down. They're independent. Yeah, they're independent, they're non-structural. Yeah, so it's, it definitely can evolve. I, I want, before I open the question, I, wanted, I, I, I neglected to mention one thing in introducing Norman that also speaks to Bob Stern's uh, uh, fundraising prowess, and that is that Lord Foster has himself uh, endowed a professorship at the Yale School of Architecture, which is a wonderful. <laughs> Actually, on that, I'd just like to say that that was really uh, Elena and I, a family initiative, and, um, and it was um, obviously in part for the fact that it was Yale and for all the reasons that I mentioned. But what I didn't say, it was also about Bob, because the way that Bob has carried that extraordinary tradition of great teaching. And, um, and, and I think that uh, Bob is not just a great teacher, but has the self-confidence to be able, which really makes a great teacher, of bringing in extraordinary talents from outside. That shows a measure for me of self-confidence. Um, and uh, so that was another reason for uh, coming in this direction. I should point out, thank you for saying that, that uh, I, I, I will not be able to join this party, uh, dinner party tonight because uh, at 6.30, this term's 
Norman Foster visiting professor is giving his uh, the lecture <laughs> the first evening of the school semester. Uh, and he is David Adjay. Um, uh, and the Foster professorship encourages us to invite international practitioners to the school, which we love the idea of. And David Adjay, as some of you may know, is a uh, Ghanaian-born, London-based uh, architect who seems to spend a lot of time going around the world, but is the architect of the new African-American museum that is being built on the Mall in Washington, DC, among many other important projects. So um, he sends his regrets that he can't be with you, Norman. Um, uh, and I'm, Norman has sent his regrets that he can't be at the lecture either. <laughs> So let's take some questions um, from the audience. And the ground rules for this uh, have been quite explicitly laid out for me. And that is, I'm to recognize the first question from this room and the second question from one of the satellite rooms. Uh, and it's also very important that the questioners speak into the microphone so everyone can hear one another. So uh, is there anyone in this auditorium with a question or comment? The one on the upper left, Rick. OK, yes, over here. Yeah. Um, just uh, having read about uh, another university that backed out of a building for science labs, uh, I just wanted people to speak about the, how they feel uh, this example and other buildings at Yale will give other universities uh, courage to go ahead with this type of architecture. What, what do you see in your various uh, travels and interactions about the effect on other universities? I was thinking first of the United States, but in light of your guest lecturer tonight uh, in other parts of the world as well. Hmm. You want to take that? Well, <clears throat> um, when I edited down this talk, I took out um, buildings that uh, we started to create on other campuses, for example, Stanford in 1996. And, um, I would say that if you visit those buildings, um, and I think as an architect, you learn a lot by experience, you get a lot of feedback. So although this building is absolutely special to its place, its function, uh, those um, very powerful and enlightened ac academics who've been part of the process and guided us, nonetheless, um, it does embody, embody uh, a, a lot of experience from, from other projects. So my answer to your question would be that time is an important element in the evolution of a building. If you go back to those buildings which seek to encourage interaction between different disciplines, which is very much at the heart of the philosophy of this school of management, um, and again, that is different from a school of medicine in terms of research, but there are common denominators in terms of cross-fertilization. And that is, I think, um, interestingly, as I look there, leadership in an increasingly complex world, increasingly complex, it's very much about breaking down barriers, and it's the social spaces. So I would say that the test of, as you phrase it, this kind of architecture I think that you will measure that when you come back years hence. In the same way that you can measure it tangibly by those kinds of buildings where you can go back, you can talk to the people who are using them, you can talk to the people who've graduated from them, you can see the effect on their careers in the same way that I can walk around uh, this campus, and I can see the effect of those buildings on my career from my past, which I couldn't judge at, at, at that time. Um, I think that to be an architect, you have to be an optimist. You have to have a belief in the future. The only constant is change, um, and I think that this building is in that spirit. I would just add to the, to the question um, about whether other universities are, uh, are likely to continue to take risks and build uh, innovative buildings. You know, there's been a, na a natural tendency towards conservatism, less building, fewer new projects since the recession hit. And that's, so we're in a kind of cycle right now where um, I wouldn't necessarily interpret decisions to stop a building or to, 
take a conservative approach or a less expensive approach to building as necessarily a permanent uh, feature. I think most universities like the idea of using their campuses as a way to experiment with the use of space. I mean, that's one of the great things, what Boster said, one of the great things about Yale is, is the way we have kept you know, in, in the vanguard of contemporary architecture and essentially redefining the, the campus for different generations. But isn't the School of Management here redefining the whole um, uh, issue of what is the School of Management in a digital changing, rapidly changing world? It is about experimentation. I mean, universities are about research. They're about experiments. That doesn't mean that you take crazy risks, um, but um, you know, earlier this morning, hearing the conversation about uh, the way that Dan was talking about uh, the integration of technology and creating spaces in the round and questioning the concept of the traditional lecture hall where it's one person standing up talking to the audience but being able to interact simultaneously around the world. Isn't that about risk taking? Um, isn't life about risk taking? I mean, you know, if we were not going to eliminate risk, we wouldn't have got out of bed and be here today, would we? I mean, <laughs> but I, I think there was another, I maybe misinterpreted your question, but I think you had another uh, uh, agenda. Will people, will universities, I mean, Harvard was the one that canceled the science building, <clears throat> and, 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 and it was part, it <laughs> just happened to be. No, but I, I, I realize every time I say something horrible about Harvard, I've done all these buildings for Harvard, so I don't know where that puts me. But, uh, <clears throat> but, but I think that uh, there was this terrible panic in 2008, and this building was in jeopardy, and we in the architecture building, had we opened the building in November of 2008, with the greatest party Yale had had in 20 years. And a if that had been a month later, we would have been serving uh, cube cheese from the commissary, you know? Uh, so everything is timing. And the Yale colleges, which I'm very invested in, have, would be nowhere if someone hadn't just come up to the plate with a huge gift. And it's still not quite fully funded. But um, I think so, it, uh, donors, there are many here. I do believe in donors. Um, I try to be one in my way as well, um, uh, 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 are very, very important. And then deans and presidents are very important also. If they have an appetite for quality, if they have an appetite to make things of lasting value, aside from curricular changes, then things happen. And there are lots of presidents in universities who just don't get it, but the good ones do. Question from one of the other audiences, uh, or are we doing that? Whoever queued me up. Maybe we're not. Maybe there aren't any remote audiences, and we're just talking to <laughs> ourselves. So let's do it here. They're all at the bar. Yeah. Um, how would you, um, by the way, I'm Peter Sampton, part of the team that has worked with Lord Foster. Um, how would you compare Yale to um, my alma mater, uh, let's say MIT, where the architecture is so radically different. And um, where um, when I went to school, Aero Saarinen also contributed to uh, MIT uh, in the Kresge Auditorium, which was um, a, a very bold design at that point. But in many ways, MIT, um, is almost outwardly, uh, looking outwardly, dis despite the fact that it's very early architecture um, uh, at the turn of the last century was very inward and was all one construction. But the Yale campus and the MIT campus uh, couldn't be more different. <coughs> it's interesting, I think, um, and we, we had fascinating conversations last summer with Nicholas Negroponte um, and his pioneering work at, at MIT. Um, when I think, I mean, I'd be interested in Bob's reaction to the question because it's, it's very much um, about physical form. I think of Yale as much more cohesive architecturally in terms of the way that the very physicality uh, is less about individual buildings 
things. And much, although there are some outstanding individual statements, if you like, but it is much more about the spaces formed by the buildings. When I think of MIT, I think of an extraordinary collection of very distinguished buildings, but I don't think of it in, in, in the same urbanistic terms. I suppose that the, 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 the ultimate quality about Yale as a university is it's like, more like a city in microcosm. It's the infrastructure of the spaces and the sequence between the spaces, which is more important, arguably, than any of the individual buildings. The essence of MIT is, is about its individual buildings. I don't know whether you would agree with that, Bob. I, I, I absolutely agree with it. I, I would say two things. One, the, one of the amazing things about Yale is it's embedded in the city of New Haven. So it's not just the spaces that Rogers and all of us have worked on to make, but the way the streets and the buildings of the public streets intersect with the private world of the university. MIT built one gigantic campus and one great big swallow in 1917 when they moved from Boston to Cambridge. And then they did build all these fancy buildings and they continued to do them. And they are like going into a kid, kid in a candy store. You get one of everything, but it's not a very satisfying meal, at least for me. <laughs> but I would say one thing, one thing about the original big MIT building it's this great big monumental Beaux-Arts building, and you may like it or not, but it is an amazingly flexible building and has allowed MIT to completely change over the years its internal uses without ever changing the building. It's, ex it's a brilliant conception in that sense, and um, I think this building, as Norman points out, you can take down the auditorium, the building will be here. And it's that mitten versus uh, glove problem and I, uh, that's so important. And I think MIT's built a lot of gloves recently, and they're going to have to really work to figure out what to do with them uh, in the future. <laughs> wow. I'd like to just, just one or two more words on the same subject, and, and in a way reinforcing what Bob said. I find that when I try and prepare a talk like for today, um, I, I start with a huge amount of material, and unfortunately, it's almost encyclopedic, and I have to weed it out. But at the start, I had all the early drawings of New Haven dating back to the 17th century. And it's interesting, the, the grid of this city um, is inextricably woven into the very fabric of the university, and that is the essential difference, I believe, between the two universities, the two institutions. I just want to say one thing to follow up on that idea, and I think the urbanistic part is, is very distinctive here at this university and allows one to be able to add in a way that maybe is more ambitious than other, other places. But going back to this building in Evans Hall, what I think I would walk away with in terms of talking about different kinds of architecture is the three-dimensional aesthetic quality here that allows a person to not only see it from the exterior as a sign, a symbol, a facade, but also to enter into a world that really works on behalf of the institutional values. And I think that's the way we might want to add to campuses in the future, really. You know, I, <clears throat> one comment about there, there is a distinction between the urban grid defining spaces and what Norman was saying initially about the buildings themselves and their relationship to one another also defining spaces. And our new campus in Singapore, which is uh, under construction and moving along nice, very quickly that Cesar Pelli uh, has designed, the, 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 it, it, there is no street grid. It's, an, it's a self-contained campus. A street rings three sides of it. But the, but the, um, but the first lesson that the, about the relationship between buildings and the importance of spaces between in defining a community and in a way in highlighting the various functions of the different elements, residential and science and arts and communal spaces, very much taken to heart. I mean, these are very explicitly thinking about the, the way these things are done at Yale and uh, trying to implement them uh, in Singapore. Another question. 
right here. Thank you. Um, I would like to know, you see, when you come to this uh, building, you can feel uh, the mission and the vision and the values of the School of Management, which we uh, know from Dean Snyder and we have been sharing because I'm one of the schools, Monterrey Tech, Egade Business School, part of the network. And I would like to know, how is your, how do you start designing uh, this building, you know, you start uh, talking to students, talking to faculty, to so what is that process that gets you to the point and studying the environment gets you to a point that you really capture everything, the needs of the students, the needs of the faculty, that vision, that uh, global network uh, 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 idea, uh, because I guess it's not only like you talk to the dean, or it has to be more than you know, you ha you have you capture. So, what is the process that you have followed for that? I think it starts with being uh, trying to be a good listener, trying to hear the many different voices, um, and and I think it's you can call that research, or you also do, um, uh, despite perhaps many denials to that effect, you do come with certain preconceptions, especially um, if this, in my case, had been uh, you know, a, a, a very important early influence. So, um, so the, the, the idea of the courtyard was not revolutionary, but it was, uh, I think, it was there from an early beginning, the idea of creating a community because in the past one had been part of, of, of that community. Um, but I think that it, it, it grows out of a long gestation. Um, it also grows out whilst you're listening and you're sharing values as a team, so you're coming at it as a group uh, with shared objectives to try to, try to do something which is excellent of its kind and is going to respond to the private needs, is going to work within the public domain. So you're exploring a lot of options, a lot of different versions. Um, and, and finally, that process, I think, narrows down and finds a consensus. The way I describe it sounds like design by committee and nothing could be further from the truth. I think that um, whether it's Rick Levin at that time, whether it's the key individuals, um, individuals like Dan, um, who, uh, but, but in that group, for example, around all those notes and games that were being played, uh, there was a student there. So th th there's a, a representation across, but in the end, I think it comes down to strong leadership, a degree of conviction, um, and a shared desire to spare no efforts. Um. I also want to add, I think it will come from the innovative programs that are being planned here now. And those programs now have a home. And they have the spaces in which there will be formal presentations, formal networks to other areas. And, and then very, very important the time and the space and the, and the way that people can interact following those presentations, the connections they make, the discussions they have. You can't do that unless you have a space that supports it. And it's a very important part of, a, of an innovative <coughs> programming that's going on in the school right now. I, 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 I think it's, I mean, I, to try to describe it, I describe the visible building like the tip of an iceberg. What you don't see is the huge body of the iceberg, which is the process. And so when you do move around this building, it has, I would like to believe, a certain lucidity. Almost, it appears, a certain simplicity. I mean, it's a series of floors you can see between the certain point you can see the two ridges within the valley. Um, and you have these movable, you can call them pods, pavilions, cottages, whatever, that make this, this community. 
but it has grown out of an extraordinary complex process, and it's a distillation. Um, and it's very difficult to describe that process in the same way it's difficult to describe a color. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one last question. We have okay. about three there after this. We spoke well, about <laughs> no, too many. <laughs> Let's. Uh, uh, we'll have somebody who <coughs> was about to start over here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, all three speakers, Lord Foster, Dean Stern, Karen Van Langen, all spoke eloquently about the way uh, Evans Hall uh, reinterprets for the 20th century. One could say the architectural DNA unique to this campus, uh, uh, particularly courtyards or loggias, uh, all employed to foster a sense of academical community, as, as Karen talked about. But in addition to what makes this building uh, sympathetic to th the campus, I'm wondering, are there aspects of designing for a school of management, as opposed to, let's say, where I come from, a school of architecture? Are there unique challenges? Is there a culture of pedagogy, of, of social interaction among staff and teachers that you had to that this building responds to? And to make the question a little tougher, is there something about the School of Management at Yale that differentiates it from its competitors that this building tries to express? That one's for you, Norman. <laughs> first part He's on my faculty. <laughs> <laughs> I should have dodged it. Uh, <laughs> I think that in reverse order, <coughs> Um, the mission statement of this school is different from, I believe, its competitors in the world of business. Um, and I truly believe the architecture reflects that. Um, it is more open, more three-dimensionally connected. Um, it is about interaction. Um, it is about its place in a totally globalized world and the way that in which it harnesses different kinds of spaces for students to interact, to break down the management, the, um, break down the boundaries rather between uh, those who are imparting knowledge and those who are absorbing knowledge um, and all the hierarchy and ambiguities and equalities between that. So in that sense, I think that it is visually different from other schools of management because it is philosophically different from other schools of management. Um, I think a school of management is different from a school of architecture, and I think that there is a reflection of that because um, the tools of the trade are different. In other words, um, this is not about producing three-dimensional representations, it's not about making solid models, it's not about state of the art of three-dimensional printing. If it was pushing the boundaries in those respects, it would be coming out differently. So this is, 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 is in a way a distillation about exchange of knowledge, meeting of minds. Um, that is a verbal world, it's a literary world. Um, and so I think that uh, although there are certain commonalities because the nature of, I mean, change is change and it's going to wash over the construction world and the political world and the world of civic leadership. Um, so there are common denominators, but there are significant differences. I think that's a great place to end. I would just suggest to all of you, you've, now you've read the book, go see the movie, that is to say. <laughs> Take, take some time around, uh, during the course of this weekend to walk through the various spaces in this building. Check out the classrooms. They really are extraordinary. The faculty offices are uh, uh, equally promotive of interaction with lots of places to stop and sit and talk. Um, it's, uh, it's really a tremendous accomplishment and something that will stand this school and this university in good stead for a very long time to come. So thank to all of you for your remarks. Thank you.